Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the International Euphonium Summit. I'm your host, Nicholas Hofter von Heidi with Farm for Dreams. And today we have our guest, Moral Martins, uh, from officially Norway now? Yeah, officially Norway now, but I'm from Portugal. From Portugal, but uh, as we've uh, spoken over the last couple of weeks, he, uh, I thought he was going to do another festival because it's been a uh, very active summer uh, <laughs> uh over the last few months and so i was like what are you doing are you doing uh, another festival he's like no i moved uh oh okay <laughs> so welcome to moral martins uh everybody uh welcome him on and uh drop a comment uh below uh and let us know uh where you're watching and uh where you're watching from and uh with further ado moral martins is a, a portuguese euphonium player international artist who highlights his love for music and his dedication to learning as the motor of his career. Winner of the Concua uh, Tuba Tour uh, 2019 contest, he has been performing several recitals and top master classes around the world. He is a euphonium teacher uh, of the Professional Music School from Covia and Music and Dance Academy of Fundo. Fundo. Released his first solo CD in 2020, Flow. Uh, Adam's brass artist, uh, performing artist, Brass Lab Momo, uh, which is his mouthpiece, uh, his go-to. He's very adamant about that. So if you've uh, read the transcripts to this interview, you'll see how important that mouthpiece really is. Maybe we'll cover it. And a Dennis Wick artist. Uh, welcome to the International Euphonium Summit, the first one ever. 2023 thank you very much to put this up i'm looking forward to this interview and to see the interviews that you are doing absolutely um, i'm looking forward to seeing what impact uh will be created and ripple affected throughout the world uh especially as we get these translated in and um ca closed captioned i guess would be another great way to uh reach into the global atmosphere of uh, the euphonium artist, current and future. Uh, thank you so much. Um, what age did you start playing euphonium? I started to play the euphonium with 15 because <laughs> I, I started to play uh, trumpet with 10 years old. And uh, then uh, I was thinking to... I love that, you know, I was always uh, practicing at home, that uh, music from the wind band that I was. And uh, at some point, I really liked the sound of the guy that played the phonium in my wind band. Then I, I went to YouTube and I searched for uh, euphonium. Who's and the Pierre, I, I don't even remember the name of him. He was an amateur <laughs> euphonium player. But you like the sound so much you switched over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I went to YouTube and I searched for euphonium. And then appeared David Childs. <laughs> and for the first time I saw the video of him playing, um, I think Gabriel Zobwe from Menu Morricone. I told, is that? Now I want to be a euphonium player. And uh, But in the wind band, they didn't let me because they need I was the kind of the principal trumpet uh, <laughs> player uh, so then I went to study music to the professional school that now I'm teacher and uh, yeah I did the profonophonium I did two weeks on ophonium and then I needed to play a little piece and uh, yeah I was accepted and I started to play ophonium because of David Charles so what was your first euphonium that you had your hands on and your your mouth to it was a yama six to one i think the, no yama uh, with the four valves up. okay three i two, don't one. know three, three two, two one. one yeah yeah uh that's 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 kind of like i as you watch the interviews uh most uh the majority of euphonium uh artists will have started either on a Yamaha 321, um, especially in uh, the newer to, um, well, the last 20 years per se, of euphonium students start out on a 321. So if you, uh, you yourself that are watching or your family members are watching, Yamaha 321 is kind of the go-to model for beginner artists. Um, 
that are start studying or have uh, instrument access at their schools. Uh, so that's the typical horn that you want to uh, kind of start out on, unless Maro has something other than uh, other to say. Would you start out on a compensating, or would you? No. You like that uh, to use the three, two, one first? No, I I would go for euphonium with three and one, not with the fourth ear, because I just feel that is not ergonomic at all. So now I would go for Sonic from Adams, the new student model. Oh, really? I, I haven't gotten to uh, play on the Sonic version. I've only played on uh, the one, two, and three uh, here in Texas at the uh, the TMEA Music uh, Educators Association yep. here. Uh, so when did, do you know when the Sonic was first developed? Yeah, we just developed that, uh, I would say, we started four years ago or something like that, and it was released three to two years ago. But uh, it was, it's a special instrument, handmade, even if it's for uh, students, it's an instrument that is handmade, that the bell is exactly the same from the professional uh, models. Lead pipe is exactly the same of professional. So when you play on it, you don't feel it as a, a student model. I record the sonata of uh, Benedetto Marcello, okay, F so, minor. So, so it's on YouTube. Okay, I'm cool. playing with Sonic. And I'll link that below for those that are uh, beginner artists uh, who are interested in looking at that model for uh, from Adams. Uh, listen to the intonation tone and... And the sound, that's the point. It's an instrument that you can have the sound of a professional euphonium because I have a lot of pieces from professional euphoniums. So it, it's, it's really special. So do you think that it would be a great, not only starter horn, but a horn to take the student artist to the collegiate level? Yeah, you can play that instrument for a lot of years. Oh, awesome. I would, I would say that I would change that instrument to a professional one when I went to like first year of university or second year of university. You can play everything on that horn. That's awesome. So you're, um, hmm. are there any adaptions that, uh, the university student could make to uh, last to take that horn even further, like the Lafork plates uh, or any other maybe triggers that are on that instrument. We 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 don't use triggers on the student model, but the good stuff of, about that instrument that you don't have in many other student models is the intonation and the sound. It was all made for sound and uh, for have the tune exactly as a professional model and not uh, like we will do a student model that will be cheaper than we just do it. No, it was a, a thing that we taught a lot. We did a lot of prototypes. We tried a lot of different stuff. And in the end, uh, it's... So it's you're, very, you're very uh, involved in that process. Yes, I tried it several times. Yeah. So this is not just a slight recommendation you're uh you would recommend all the uh as many school systems that even are watching um that are looking to find the best edge for their euphonium performers euphonium artists at their level whether it's middle school junior high uh high school even uh, here in the United States and the secondary schools across the world uh, to really consider uh, the sonic model from Adams. Yeah, because when we develop it, I think it's very important when you develop an instrument or you say to someone to buy that instrument, I know what it costs, you know, for the family, sometimes for the student that need to work two or three years. I would never say buy it if I know that is not good or if they are just using the money that they work so much for nothing, you know? Right. So it was it was one of the parts why we, we did a so good uh, student model, you know? And not one that we would do in a place like China that would be much more uh, cheap or something like that. We did everything in the factory, everything handmade, everything exactly like we do professional uh, models, exactly because of that. Like the first 
the, the only thing that Adams care about is the quality. The quality, absolutely. And that's and that's the point. In a student model or in any model, when you buy Adams, you need to buy quality. Right, absolutely. And for those that are, um, I mean, for those that are parents that are watching this that are not, uh, uh, there's a lot of knowledge gap per se between a, a parent of a euphonium artist, beginner, high school level to collegiate level um, that are unsure of where to start uh, in the process of looking for a euphonium. And there, there, are, there are a considerable amount of copies or reproductions or lesser quality. Uh, I, I, would, I would highly recommend uh, every parent to consider um, that quality going back to your own like dream career or where you find yourself at work. Like, would you use a, uh, a poor quality of uh, your particular product to do your job? The most effectively and efficiently to become the best you can be or would you get a great quality at a uh, a, a really fair uh price yeah that could really get you to that next level and set your student even above kind of the competition or their fellow uh competitive um regions as a performer and also for for because when you have an instrument that is that don't have that much quality after some time it has a note that is a quarter tone down sometimes or many notes or the sound it doesn't really vibrate like it uh, should and you you start to listen that and that starts to be normal for you so when you you go to another phone you, you will need to work on that notes for you can put that notes in tune on your mind again you know so you are kind of learning wrong and that's that's also a very important uh, thing if you cannot have a really good sound on that ophonium if even if you work a lot for have that uh, that three or four notes in tune and it's just impossible because sometimes they're one a quarter tone down Absolutely. It's really interesting that you bring that up, uh, Moro, is that uh, you're not only hurting your sound, you're also hurting and damaging your lips because you're learning that pitch wrong. And so you think it's not, you think it's you, uh, the student thinks it's their fault or the band director thinks it might be the student's fault. And so the student has to learn to adapt to either a new mouthpiece or a new way to um, place their mouthpiece or learn something that they shouldn't even need to learn. And they end up damaging long-term their their minds, uh, like he was saying just now, of pitch, um, even like eventually probably even, you know, damaging the lips to where you're, they're not going to be able to perform to their highest potential even four, five, six years into playing. So once they get to graduate high school, they're not gonna be anywhere close to where they could be. If yeah, they or, or they start to get tired of try, 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 and don't get the sound that they want, and then they give up. And exactly. that happens sometimes. All the failures that compile uh, on top of each other. I mean, it's, it's a lot like going to the gym, like you said. You said in our interview uh, before in the transcripts, uh, going to the gym and utilizing a sub uh, subpar uh, piece of equipment, and you end up hurting your muscle or creating more fatigue that that shouldn't be there because of the quality of the equipment that you use. Yeah. Or so in fact, when we try an instrument, I'm I'm not selling it. I of have course. a lot of different brands. But uh, what I say to all the students when they tell me, yeah, which instrument should I play? Or which instrument do you think? Of course, I will say Adams. Not because 
it's the brand that I'm artist because I believe on that brand. I'm going to the stage with this brand and I could go with other, but I go with this brand because I believe and this is the one that I think is the best for me. But I never say to the students, buy Adams. I say, try Adams and try all the ones that you can mm -hmm. and decide yourself. Absolutely. I think that's the best. And I think that also goes well with mouthpieces as well, because that mouthpiece you know, the typical beginner artist starts out on a typical Bach six and a half A or AL, uh, which is the uh, shank size, the the part of the mouthpiece. And this is one of my, so if you, uh, yep. the six and a half AL is considered this part right here, whether it's small, medium, or large uh, within the euphonium context. Um, that's not my actual mouthpiece. It's one that I bought and uh, I don't utilize uh just because my my structure, I that's not my my golden fit. Even though that was a really cool gold mouthpiece, uh, so uh, that's a really in depth look and and a really awesome takeaway that you bring to the table for all the parents and students, uh, student artists who want to progress with or even consider in knowing that it's not your fault. It, it may not be your fault. It might be the quality of instrument that you're playing. Yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes, absolutely. 10% of the time. 10%? <laughs> All the other ones is work. Long tones normally. But uh, yeah, I, and uh, I try to never go to that part of like speaking about instruments, speak, uh, speaking about the mouthpiece because I don't know which mod piece is the best for you, for right. example. I know it's the best for me. And uh, if you want to to try it, perfect. You so know? Let, let's, let's, let's uh, dive into that. How many other mouthpieces did you try before you found Momo? Too many. many. It was years. And after I found Momo, I never changed my mod piece again. How long did it take you to uh, find your authentic sound, your 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 uh, ideal sound that you really wanted. How long did it take when you uh, transferred all those mouthpieces to learn Momo's? Uh, how it felt on your face? How yeah. how it how it melds with you? Yeah, after I really get comfortable with Momo, it was like three weeks three because weeks? it's a very different uh, mouthpiece. And my mod piece were all in U, and this one it's in V, so it's a change. And uh, and uh, yeah, it it needs a little bit of time to to get adjustment. Get yeah, to so adjustment. It's, but it's interesting. Uh, the well, for our beginner artists and parents of these artists or loved ones, um, when he was referring to V and U. It's the bowl inside the mouthpiece, the cup. Yes. Uh, cup. And so the V, obviously, uh, the throat would be down here. Um, and then the bowl, uh, the usual uh, typical mouthpiece for yeah. our instrument is a bowl shape. Um, and so that's where we uh, are talking about. So, yeah. Uh, when did you first realize that you wanted to pursue euphonium uh, as a dream job? what you're doing now it was when i start because i start a little bit old i start with 15. so i i knew that with 15 years old 16 would have a lot of amazing of funny players and much better than me so i needed to work like crazy and then i i was thinking like okay but is really that that i want because for i go to study in that school I needed to live there, you know. So with 15 years old, I went out of the house of my parents and I live in the in a flat alone in, for uh, studying that school. And that was a lot of money for my parents. And uh, when you study in a professional school of music, it's very difficult to go to other thing in the university, you know. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. And uh, especially because I wanted to... If I would not be a phonium player, I wanted to be scientist or something uh, in that area. And uh, I knew that I would not have the base for that. And yeah, then I I realized from the beginning that it was that, that uh, that I wanted. So with 15 years old, in after two or three weeks in that school, I I start to 
wake up at 6 a.m. I did a kind of contract with the cleaning lady, as I told you before. Mm -hmm. So at 7, uh, she opened the door. She arrived in the school and opened the door for me. I had just one room without lights or something. Just that room had the lights and I couldn't go any other place in the school. And uh, the lesson started at 9. So just before lesson started, I had two hours. And uh, we had one hour, for example, for uh, one hour and an half, I think, for uh, lunch. And I used one hour for practice there. And was I went to the cantina 30 minutes before uh, it closed. Uh, I practiced all the breaks. I practiced after school uh, until 11, when the school was open until 11. And yeah, it was my life for six years. So... I can say that the first time I went to a bar, it was when I finished it six years uh, after I was six years in that school. So it was in the day after my final exam. It was when I went first time to a bar. Wow. So you're at that time, you're 21. Yes. That's awesome. So when you first started and you have this routine throughout uh, your studies at the uh, conservatoire, the conservatory, did you find yourself like from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m.? Did you practice the straight two hours or did you allow for uh, time off the horn to consider what you were the mind frame that you were wanting to work in? Yeah, from seven to eight, I normally did breathing, buzzing, long tones, and my warm up. It was always a really long warm up because I knew I needed a, a lot of basic exercise. And at eight, they opened the school for the other students. So then at eight, I would go to drink a coffee in the coffee machine, relax a little bit, and then I would start with basic exercise until nine. Okay, so, hmm. so you hit basic exercises for the first part, or did you hit uh, as you uh, for when you first started? Do you find did you find yourself working the basic fun foundations? to a euphonium artist each element of practice you had throughout the day yeah that's awesome so long tones breathing um i normally did long tones two times a day and then flexibility articulation all kinds of flexibility all kind of articulation dynamics range everything now you already had uh you already had kind of the articulation uh, down with playing trumpet, being a principal trumpet from age 10 to 15, correct? Yeah. So that but was... it was in a really low level uh, amateur band. Okay. Okay. So how did you, when did you first learn double tonguing and, and those extended techniques? Yeah, all of that was in the school with 15. Huh, okay. Uh, because it was a... Uh... My band, I was, when I start with 10, also that band start with 10. So even the conductor, teachers there, it was all, all of them were kind of new on that. Even the conductor, you know, was uh, the techniques also, the way that we, we learn was very different and very, very basic. So, so I remember the first time I went to play in that band, we didn't have like uh, the um, young people band or something. We went straight to that principal because in fact the level was a level of a young uh, ah. wind band. So we, I just went to that in the concert and I could almost, I couldn't almost uh, play one piece, you know. Wow. So I remember that when I went to that school, I, I didn't knew so much about even scales. I knew C and G and was that. Huh. So when did you start working on the all the majors and either all the forms of minor was uh, obviously that was at the conservatory? Yes. And did you learn how quick were you to memorize the scales? I, when I started uh, my teacher, in fact, it was one of the things that I hated most practicing scales. scales. Really? Yeah, but my teacher was quite uh, hard with me. 
So I, I needed to practice that every day and I start to put that in my daily routine also. Okay. Uh, did you uh, start with scales? Uh, obviously, uh, one octave or did you start with two octaves since you had the... one, one, one octave. because I, I even now it can it, it, the people think that I'm really talented because of all the range and all, yeah. but uh, in fact, it's not true. My teacher tried to put me to tuba or other instrument because I was the worst, you know. I was not talented at all. So the first two years that I studied in that conservatory, my teacher tried to change me for tuba or for other instrument because uh, he told me, you will never be a funny player. It's completely impossible. <laughs> what? What was that drive shift then? What was your, how did you shift your mind from going, being told that, that you're not going to be a euphonium player to where you're at now? What, what was that mindset change? Who, who helped you switch over? Ah, uh, but, but, uh, I never really listened to him. So I wanted to be a euphonium player because in my mind, I wanted to be exactly like David Childs that I saw on the video. Yeah. And if even if I needed to work to practice eight hours a day, I would do and I did. That's phenomenal. I did practice eight hours a day sometimes. So like said... sleep. I, when I arrived home, I was so tired that I opened the computer for in that times we almost didn't use Facebook. Instagram didn't exist, but Facebook was starting. So I wanted to check Facebook or something like that. And many times the computer didn't uh, even uh, open you know i slept before that wow because so... i was so tired of so much practicing so yeah the only point that i saw was david childs and playing like him huh. i still didn't arrive there just for you know but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but still... uh, it was my goal and uh yeah it was a person that even without know me on that time uh he, he was like my idol on that moment still be one of how, how do you feel your progress has come over the years to getting to a level that you would consider david childs like on that i was just young you know i i listened to him playing with that sound and all that notes and all that beautiful melodies and uh it was. It is completely no sense. I know, like be, playing like David Child is no sense because well, it's the way that that David plays, not the right, way that I would usually. ever play. Yeah. But I was young, and uh, when we are young, sometimes we just need to dream like young people, and it was what I did. That's awesome. Like I wanted to be like him, and I studied for be like him. It's all. So how 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 would you? Okay, let me put it in a different way then. Have you? felt like you've reached a an acceptable place and, and yes there's always room for growth when we've never master we never master our instrument completely to our fullest ever potential however there is a base level of um of acceptance of what we sound like and where we're at uh, how do you feel like where do you feel like you're at that point right now as a Adams performing artist and going all over the world and soloing and doing all this? Yeah, I feel that I'm in a good level now. I'm in a good shape. I like the way that I play and uh, I like sometimes the way that I sound, but I'm sometimes. really critic, you know, so it's really uh -huh. difficult for me. So all the times that I listen to me, I think, okay, now I need to practice even more on that, 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 and I go for it, you know? What, so what what is your... Uh, we like I say it on other interviews as well or all the artists really get to that point of you know where where our own worst critic and in those moments what is that for you where where do you feel like you criticize your own playing yourself yes I I, I criticize a lot but now I also for my mindset and for my mind be a little bit healthy, I also start to understand and listen to me like three or four years ago, you know, and all the evolution that I did from there until now. And that is, is very important. It's very important that you try to enjoy the moment. Of course, you will be better next year. It's, it's like, it's normal. 
but uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot, for example, do a recording now of a CD. Of course, you will think that if you would do that next year, it would be better. Everyone uh, would do that, you know, because if you keep practicing, you keep developing. That's the way that it is. But yeah, it's it's we have different uh, chapters, different steps in our career, and I'm I just doing mine. That's awesome. So when you left for the uh, when you left your parents' house at 15, a lot a lot in America that's that's not typical. That doesn't happen uh, in most cases, um, in most every case, uh, in fact. But when you started to learn euphonium, you went out at 15. What did your parents say when you when you did that? When you said yeah. you to leave? They in fact what they did was like okay, we don't want you to say that we didn't let you be what you want to be in the future. So you go, but they were really like apprehensive, you know? They didn't really want and they didn't knew. I don't have any I didn't have any professional musician in my musician in my family or in my town. Uh but uh, they understood that I really liked it. Since I'm uh, six or five years old, uh, when I went to the school, after the school, I went to my grandparents. Uh, and my, my grandfather was a saxophone player and he played oh. for me every day, you know? And then they opened that wind, uh, amateur wind band in my town. And... Uh, I was the first one. I, I like when they told they will open the wind band again because my grandfather played there before and then he kept the saxophone until they open it again. And when they open it again, I was like, wow, I was the second one uh, sending an application for start, you know, for because I listened to them when I was very young, like six, seven. And I remember that until now, the place, everything. I remember also my grandfather playing for me every day. And uh, I was just crazy about it, you know? Like, imagine with uh, 10 years old, 11 years old, I needed to leave from home for go to the school at 8.30. So I would wake at 6.30 for can play trumpet 30 minutes before I go to the school. At 7.30, I was playing trumpet at home. Did, sometimes did 7.30, sometimes... No, because they were wet, so easy. <laughs> but they start to understand that. And then when I receive a flyer about that school, uh, I start to think about that, you know, and Google a little bit was not so normal, the internet on that point, but the Google uh, existed already, so we could Google a lot, and uh, yeah, I, I I just loved it, you know, loved to listen to music, loved to play, and it was, uh, I think, a natural choice for me, and uh, then they kind of understood that, but of course they were a bit uh, afraid because they didn't knew nothing about to be a euphonium player or a classical musician. The, the orchestra that was more close on that moment is like two hours driving in Porto, for example, from my town, so we didn't have nothing to, to see or something like that. So do your parents come out and uh, listen to any of your performances? Yes. That's all of amazing. them all of them that's amazing that's great support yeah wow so who would you who would you say would be besides david childs uh and your grandfather uh for music wise playing the saxophone at to you at age five and six who would you say would be the next like instrumental yes pun intended instrumental in your progression as a musician yeah so first was yeah as you told my grandfather because he played every day for me and that's why i started to play an instrument then david Childs because i listened to him and i chose the euphonium and i think the next big uh like idol for me in my career was uh sergio carlino my teacher at the uh, university because he kind of show me what is a international artist and what is a guy that goes to the stage and just like it's home for him you know it was one of the first persons speaking about mindset to me about uh, how to prepare to go to the stage and uh, he, the point about sergio uh, and sergio as a teacher is that he doesn't speak that much you know he he speaks what he needs to speak and then he shows you he doesn't say like when you go to the 
stage you cannot do that and that and be he be like yeah i will do a recital today do you want to come and listen yeah and you will learn everything from that as like uh gene pokorny says have uh, three ways of uh, learning and is um copying what you listen yeah the three of them so mm -hmm. copying copying and copying so you need to listen to the others and uh, copying that and it was a little bit what i did with sergio i see how he moves in the stage how he is in the stage and uh, yeah is that not copy i want to say imitation well you make it your own imitation yeah you, you, it's it's the way that we do everything it's the way that we start to to speak and you don't speak exactly like your mother or your father does right in some way you start to to do your way so is 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 that that is learning music it's to listen to the others to to imitate them and then you will find your way because it's not possible that i will imitate david childs every day and then i turn david childs but if i listen to cello players, violin, piano players, voice, sophonium, trombone, then I, I create my own voice in what I listen, you know? I think that's, that's the way to kind of create ourselves. That's amazing. So when did you, uh, what was the first, besides the Yamaha 321, what was your next instrument that you... Uh, I, I was not, I was with Yamaha like six months, oh, and okay. then I changed for a BNS. BNS, so Besson, or the BNS. BNS. Yeah. Hmm. B and S. I don't oh, know. Oh, B and S. Yes. Yeah. So, what was uh, at that level? Was that was that your first compensating or? No, it was not compensating. It's still student. So My what... first compensated was a Besson Subarine. Oh, I didn't have awesome. much money, so I, I got a I got a really good deal with a um, a model that was that they were showing in the fairs, uh -huh. and uh, so they did a special price, and then I got it. Oh, that's cool! And how did you like that uh, Best and Sovereign? It was a great instrument, good sound, uh, not too much like uh, heavy. It's mm -hmm. uh it's a kind of light instrument, but with a good sound. I I love that. That's cool. And do you find your the current atoms that you're performing on, as far as weight goes, uh, which one would be? Uh, do you still have your best in sovereign? No. No, you got rid of it. That's cool. Uh, what would what was what's heavier in a way? Uh, my instrument is have a sterling bell, so my instrument is a little bit heavier. That's really yeah. awesome. I, I love sterling silver uh, part of the bell. Uh, I tend to think that rose brass would be a really awesome uh, bell for a euphonium. But that's my personal uh, yeah. take in, you know, as far as cosmetics and stuff, is it's uh, that sterling really is uh, stunning. Uh, yeah, and to have a pure startling bell, it's, it, it really changes the sound. Man, that, I, I, I look forward the next time you're, uh, you're in the area down here in Texas. Uh, maybe we could uh, have some coffee together and uh, share some of the impact that we see sure. on, the, on this, uh, from this interview uh, precisely. So what do you recommend uh, our beginner artists that are watching uh, to start using, uh, utilizing as far as, uh, we already uh, kind of talked about like horns and mouthpieces and finding, you know, their own fit, but are there any apps that you would recommend or recording devices or, you know, kind of extra equipment that yeah. may be beneficial? In fact, when I was young, I, I kind of used that uh, it equipment for I don't get tired, you know, like for I don't get uh, tired of the always the same exercise and for I, you know, I use that like we use, okay, now I will start in the gym, I will uh, buy a new equipment and then it's like you are looking for your work to use that and then you go to the gym and that gives you like an extra 
extra thing to go to the gym. You will you use that for for you can go to the gym more times because you like to wear that equipment. It was a little bit like that that I start to to buy my for example my balloon that is a really good uh, accessory, but that you can do the things also without it. Like what? Or, hold on, hold on. Let's let's dive into that. What what do you mean by? Uh, especially for those in the United States watching this, what do you mean for our beginner artists and parents? What do you mean by balloon? I don't know the balloon, like six liters balloon. So a big balloon. Uh, so a big balloon. Yeah, it's a breathing. Uh, we call balloon, but I don't know if it's balloon the real name of it. So so, so we'll, we'll. But it's like breathe. It's a six liter balloon that you breathe in and you can breathe out and breathe in and breathe out and you can see. Uh, you have five liters, six liters, and seven liters. I think. Yeah. So I I bought that exercise for they they give me like a extra motivation for can uh, because the first first the first two years or three years i didn't have any accessory you know but then i start to be a little bit like tired to do always uh, exercise and then i was thinking okay then if i buy maybe that balloon or the breath builder or the other one with the with the ping pong ball uh, it will kind of give me a extra motivation because I can do exercise with that uh, kind of accessories. Yeah, then that's... I start to to use them as motivation, not that you need to use them. Right, you know, right. But that's that's an interesting. You're the uh, you're one of the first artists to say um, that in that way and utilize a piece of equipment as. Um, as a motivation incentive uh, to, or even even as a reward of yeah. practicing uh, and learning this skill. Yeah. Um, you know, wow, I, I sure hope that the ones that need this get to hear that part because um, I never, man, that, that, that kind of changes my thought process of uh, adding another element of teaching to a student artist um, and and I hope that it does the same um, the same mindset shift for the beginner artist teachers uh, in the like middle school high school uh, and for those that need that extra incentive or kind of to gauge where they're at. Yeah. Hmm. That's fascinating. I never considered that. Yeah, but that is is like, it's easy. It's how it works, you know? It's how yeah. the human works. Like, if you want to go to the gym, the first stuff that you should do, it's to buy new clothes to go to the gym that you really like to wear. Then you go because you want to wear them. And this is, if you have a small change that you really like, like if you are doing a really restrict diet and you are eating always what you don't like and like you are completely tired of that diet, you will stop to do it. But if you add a little bit of, for example, peanut butter, that will change nothing in the calories or we change a little bit, but you just find a way right. to put that in. It, it changes everything, you know, you will keep much more longer and you will see more results. And was that the way that I, I found like to don't stop to do breathing exercise or the buzzing part? At some point I was like, I will not do buzzing anymore. Then I bought a burp. I did like, I also bought a book for buzzing that I didn't have for the different exercise, not just scales that in fact had exactly the same result, but they were different exercise. And yeah, it uh, gave me extra motivation, you know? When did you start applying that mindset? Because for a lot of the parents may not see that same way to motivate their student artists to uh, take on certain elements. Uh, and so their student may not even be, student artists may not even be watching this, but they can uh, start um, rewarding their student in, in even hopes to um, 
enjoy practicing at home uh, yep. per se. So that's that's really intriguing. When did you In start? fact, this one was not something that I read because it, that was much before that I started to read about mindset and uh, anxiety and how to control and how your brain works and all of that. But uh, it was a simple thing that I just uh, thought because it's exactly like I saw what it gave to me when I buy a new stuff and it would be exactly the same if I buy accessory. The difference is that they are much more expensive than uh, if you buy right. <laughs> like an, uh, yeah, something in the minibar <laughs> or something. Right. So I didn't put a lot of stuff. But sometimes, you know, like to use, uh, I I didn't, my metronome started to be really old and I told, I really wanted to have, for example, that Korg one, the black one. Yeah. That kind of box. The it's TM40. amazing. And then I bought it and it was like five years. Always in the metronome, really proud to have that metronome, you know. It's just all that I wanted was to enjoy my practice and I couldn't stop. So because I, I want, I want, I want to for me, you. when I... When I didn't did all that I organized in the paper, you know, because uh -huh. I always write what I want to play in the paper, what kind of exercise, I always organize my week. If I fail one point, that would be a extremely sad day for me. So all that I wanted was that I didn't get sad. So with that being said, would you, taking the gym concept of clothes, right? Do you take that and transcend that into your practice also? Like you wear comfortable clothes that you you are completely relaxed and uh, in your happy spot. Like, or, or do you not care what you wear in your practice as opposed to the gym? I, I care about uh, what I choose for my clothes every day, not just for the practice, but for my daily. I need to be comfortable and I need to feel good on that. Huh, that's that's amazing. So, wow. I I hope, uh, I hope that the what you're bringing to our community it leaves them considering what is their comfort spot to where they feel uh, that they are proud to be who they are and accept who they are. Uh, with yeah. no qualms, no, no resistance to that for themselves, and it's okay to be who they are. That's yeah, yeah, that's really... that's the that's the point. That's and awesome. uh, it was really difficult. For example, I, I was as I told you. For example, that range thing that we spoke uh, before, uh, that people say is that is like I'm really talented because I have all that range. But it was something that it was writing down that I wrote down, you know, on that paper. I, now I want to, this goal for this semester is to arrive to that note, not that note at least, you know. Uh, because I remember in the beginning I had one octave and an half, and I had that for almost one year and an half. It was really difficult for me in the range. After, uh, after it was a little bit faster, but in, in the beginning it was very difficult. And... Uh, you know, after some time, I arrived to, for example, a A E I A, or very I A. I don't know how to translate that in English. Uh, but uh, I wanted to go more because I want, you know, because it's a goal for me in my practice, and I wanted to keep developing. Then I wanted to go more, and I had some teachers there that told me, "Don't do because that's stupid. You will never use that in your life." Or and and I always told like, but let me just do it. It's just a goal, like uh, like do single tonguing one hundred fifty or something. That's a goal. I, I will never use single tongue one hundred fifty. I think I will prefer to use double. Double tongue. Or... Yeah. Anyway. Right. But at some point, I, I was really feeling that it's like many times you just don't need to listen. You know, it's like David Childs said in the first masterclass. Uh, that I had with him, uh, he did the three master class in Portugal, like a tour. Uh -huh. In my second year in that conservatory, uh, and I went to the three. Uh, I remember first time I saw him uh, after he played the first notes in the recital, I was crying like a baby, you know. <laughs> it was a really crazy moment. And now I remember all that moments when we were, for example, together in IT in the festival in Atlanta, the Adam Frey Festival. 
we were uh, drinking beer, speaking, and I was like, you remember all of that? I was like, and uh, he even have photos still, you know, from that uh, time. Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, and it's so funny to do all of that. And sometimes we just don't need to listen, you know. And in the first masterclass, he told, okay, now I'm speaking about all of this. Don't put anything like in the garbage, you know. You use this for two weeks and then you understand what works for you and what don't work for you. And then you do our own. And I do like that from since I'm young, you know. I see what works for me and my goals. It was the only thing that I never wanted someone to have an opinion about. Why you need to have an opinion about my goals? If one of my goals is play solo with Berlin Philharmonic, I will go for it. Even if I don't reach it, it's my goal. If so you tell that, me it's impossible, so, I don't care. So know? is that one of your goals? I don't know. I will not tell you. Oh, man. I, I would love to see can be, the can be. <laughs> I would also love to see. Okay. Okay. I'm making that note right here. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it was an example, but you understand what I mean. It's like, I do. It's so many opinions nowadays, you know, and you listen so many things for so many people saying, why do you want to be a phonium player? What's the future for a phonium player? What will you be for a phonium player? Why you don't start to practice more trombone? Because I don't want, right? Because I don't like, because all oh, I love to play trombone, but I don't want to be a trombone player. I want to play sometimes trombone and I like it, but is that? By the way, I'm horrible playing trombone. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You're better at trumpet, right? Uh, also not so good on trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like it's our dreams. We live one time. Okay, that depends on what you think, but it's like it's so many things you know on social media and all that stuff and the students are starting to be sick also about social media i see it on on my master class when they tell yeah but now i fail and i tell yeah welcome man you fail perfect you will go to my recital today i will also fail how you feel about that now i'm a bad professional player like it's a fail all that you see in instagram and all sometimes for they play like listen to people live go to it's what i i say to people like you love to listen alessi on the computer yeah but listen live it will be better it is it will be better like it's do you real. love the sound of them andre go live it's right. better you know and you know what he fails and i fail and david failed and alessi fails and everyone fails and that's part of the game like if you are playing also correct for don't fail it's so boring in the end it's like yeah perfect didn't fail i didn't feel anything you know <laughs> then why you, you go for like just enjoy the music and if you need to play that pianissimo because it's what you are feeling do it and so, if one of the times you fail something congratulations so what's what's your favorite piece that like what's your favorite piece that you go to uh to Bring it back to who you are as a performer. Oof. You know, I yes, think I'm I a did, different I person in, in I, I'm a different person, you know. I remember, for example, one of my last recitals when I play peace, you know, peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I, I was crying after. And I was playing, you know. And after I needed to play Cypher. That is like oh hip-hop music with uh, a lot of octaves that i also love but i'm not the same performance performer even if i'm the, in the same performance you know right. like when i play cypher i will not play with the same color of the sound with the same emotion that i will play for example michelangelo or it's different it's different you know so i don't think of a piece but it was a performance that I think I will I will remember for all my life that was playing Gufo. Gufo? With Ufo, Ufo, Ufo by Johan Dimage. Yeah. You know the concerto? Ufo? I will look it up. David Childs have an amazing uh, recording if you want to look it on Spotify. I'll, and and Ufo I'll, I'll also Dimage. link it below for yeah. those that are uh, listening. 
and uh, it was in a really uh, like uh, emotional stuff because it was in the fifth anniversary of Adams that they need to kind of postpone two or three years after because two years after because of the pandemic right and uh, uh, they invite all the stores that sell Adams in the world for that concert so all the the store people like the boss of that business were in Holland in the factory they did a huge stage with like 1000 uh, shares in um, in the factory and the person that went to to conduct my concert was Henry Adams you know him the conductor yes, yes. he is the brother of Mel Adams that right. makes the brass of uh, Adams and uh, he kind of knew that it would be the last concert of him or it kind of had the chance to be the last concert of him because he had the cancer. Yeah. And all that emotions to be, to knew that that person that is there, that is an amazing conductor. And I always dream to, to play with him. Uh, he would uh, probably, that would be the last concert of him. And with all the stores that there, and uh, even the boss of the Adams and all people there mm -hmm. listening to you, what, it gets you a little bit more kind of emotion. Uh, yeah emotion and then yondi may came from new york to listen to the concert wow and that concert i will never forget especially because of henry adams was there and uh, it was it was something that i cannot explain it was a different thing that i felt there wow that's it to be in that audience, to be in that atmosphere, must have been very emotionally charged, I guess yeah. you could say. Very yeah. dynamic. Um, wow. And it was a kind of very beautiful, you know, very beautiful kind of party that they did. Like we dinner all together before I went to the stage. Uh, all the people from the stores, all the people from the brand. Um, and then I went to the stage and uh, in the break, we were all together also after my, because I play in the last piece before the break. Uh, it was different, you know, it was, it was a different atmosphere that I never uh, felt in a stage. Hmm. Also, another one was that playing piece and crying after, and I needed to speak. And then one of my students was in the audience, you know, and he was like, yeah. Your voice was a little bit strange when you speak about Cypher because it was the piece that I wouldn't play after. Uh, were you a bit uh, emotional about the uh, piece? And I was like, no, no. Maybe just the throat. I needed to drink water or something, you know? <laughs> but I was crying. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes... That's the point of, I say to my students, to don't dream about the perfect performance to be the one that you don't fail. It's the one that you feel. That was when you do a good performance, you feel it. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and to to work out of that perfectionism stuff because it's not possible at all to 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 play a perfect uh, performance. You cannot play a perfect one hour recital without fail one note or without because it's not just a fail. Sometimes you play one note and it's not really in the center or something like that. You know, so just like work on on the music and when you are there just give all that you have that day that's that's tremendous i think that for those that are w listening and watching and reading all these all 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 the elements of this particular interview and moro brings a resonance uh feeling of uh prior the for those that have interviewed uh, alongside of him uh, in this International Euphonium Summit, we see that same ideal performance. It's not perfection. It's about the passion, the emotion, or even the oneness that you feel that hits the hits the deeper meaning of your soul. Um, yeah, because it's it's not possible sometimes even to practice you know for that uh, kind of stuff that sometimes your body has for example when i play now in 
in uh, America, I was feeling a crazy jet lag. You know, how can you practice for that? I felt like sick, but without being sick and tired and strange, you know. Of course, it, it will not be the, the most comfortable recital that you will play. But on that day, it was what I had. And I give all, you know. And I think that's that's the point in the end. If you go to a recital, and that happened a lot of time with the musicians, you go to, the, to a recital, of, to a concert, and you think too much technically. And now it comes that I know, okay, you reach. And now, now it is split or not, you know. You stop to enjoy the music. You just start to think about technique, you know. And as musicians, we should never lose that part of try to enjoy music, you know. I, I'm so happy, for example, I was so happy when I listened to David Childs there, when I listened to Glenn Van Loy there, when I listened to Adam Frey, all the people that was there, you know. Uh, Chris Olko was there. Uh, more people. Uh, Aaron Tindall. They play so amazing, you know. And and the one thing that I start to stop to think about is, okay, but now they split. Okay, but now they fell that high note. It doesn't matter, you know. No. Like, I remember the first time I, I listened to Gene Pocorny. He played one note, and I was like, wow, that sound. Jesus. It's like he could fail five times on that phrase. The ticket was paid with one note, you know? Hmm. And I think it's that. We just need to enjoy everything. Because nowadays, I think we are losing the value of everything, you know? Because everyone can speak about everything. So that phrase that are like cliche, you know? Like enjoy life. We just have one life. Everyone can use that, you know? Even if he's a person that you know that uh, doesn't even know what it means. And then you are, and everything is cliche. But one of the phrases that I really want the people to think is that we have one life, you know? If you go to the concerts and you cannot enjoy, if you go to somewhere and you cannot enjoy, then you go to the stage and also don't enjoy. What's we like... need to enjoy every day because that's, if we don't enjoy, it's no point, you know? And we can believe that we have two or three lives, but at least that we know completely. <laughs> Well, today we, we have only one. have one life. Yeah. Today, so in that, the present moment, yeah. it's just one moment yeah. right now, especially for those that are watching uh, or listening at this point. You know, what? what's life to you? What's life to, what's life in regards to your passion, your purpose, your, the reason for your being, what you want to do, where you want to be, uh, and this such a such an amazing interview and conversation about this and a lot of these interviews they're not interviews so much as a conversation between two individuals that want to bring you uh the viewer the listener into our world and get to help or be somehow impacted with you know, the experience, the, the, the passion. Yeah. Whether you're seeing it or not, or hearing it or feeling it to come alive. Yeah. To wake up. I think that's the point is the passion, you know, and that's why I never gave up. For example, when my teacher told me for change to tuba or for other instrument, because he couldn't anymore with my sound that was horrible. And I know it, uh, or when even in the university, people told me like, yeah, but you are a phonium player. You can play amazing, but you will never have a really career because you don't play in an orchestra. And all that I thought was like, man, I want to be a phonium player. And I will do everything for be the best of phonium player that I can, you know? And that's the point. Because sometimes people say, yeah, but you have the talent. No. I don't have the talent, or you, but you are Mauro. You you were born with something. Come on, I'm a human exactly like you. Work the way that it works for you, and in some time, you will be the best that you can. And is that the point? You know, that's even when sometimes people say, "Yeah, I wanted to ask you that, but 
I was so shy. Are you shy to ask another human a question? Why are you it's, shy? It's, it's that blockade that people are, are seeing. I mean, that you know, to take that initiative to to reach out beyond yourself and your own limitations up here to realize, yes, we are just human. We yep. want to we want to share our experiences. We want to share our passion yep. and share our even our failures because it's that vul vulnerability and that authenticity to know that we're the same as you, as in you have the ability to become the best you you can be. Yeah. And and when people say, yeah, but for you, like, do you want to be the best of a new player in the world? That is one of the, mo the questions that I, I was like, what? That doesn't exist. I don't know if you know. Like, you can be the faster guy running 100 kilometers or faster guy running 100 meters or faster guy running one kilometer in the world because as a championship for that. But it's not possible to be the best of a new player in the world. I, 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 what I answer to that people is like, it's possible that you are excellent in what you do. It's not possible to be the best because that doesn't exist. Is it possible to be the best that you are, that you can be, but not, you cannot compare musicians. You cannot put in this table, Demondre Thurman, Thomas Rudy, David Childs and say, so which one is best? No one. They are amazing in what they do. Is that, mm -hmm. you know, and nowadays have a lot of that, you know, and I think it's because of social media. You see so many perfection, you know, it's so perfect. It's like, yeah, now I will do my warm up. And sometimes I see people doing all the crazy stuff. And I'm like, what? I know that people in person. And that was at least 50 videos for does that, you know, but the people that doesn't know, right. they are like, I will never arrive there. I will give up. Right. And they go, you know, or, or, or they will, oof, then I will do this in my warm up. And for me, sometimes it's like, I think social media, it's amazing to show your work, you know, but in a point that you start to, 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 you need to understand that you need to kind of know how to speak there, you know. Like, don't do crazy stuff and do, yeah, that's my first exercise, you know? Do that, is, you are like doing that now or getting in shape or something. But when a 10 years old guy will see that exercise, he will do that, you know? And you need to try to avoid it because it, it we have muscles. And uh, if we don't know how the things work, like I say that a lot of times, first, first stuff, even in that exercise or high and low that uh, I sometimes put on Instagram, the first stuff you need to understand is that it's no, no pressure there. And I show that in the masterclass, like I ask a student to pick my euphonium and I play mm -hmm. for them. So if you do that exercise with pressure, you are not working. Right. You are like destroying yourself. So sometimes we just don't need to repeat everything that you listen on social media or you need to understand that social media is not completely real life. It's a lot yeah. like when, okay, so before social media existed as we especially know it now, it's the whole back, 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 <laughs> I'm going to date myself back in my days. Uh, we, we would also, we would always hear of, and it usually happened to uh, those uh, the the females that the cover girl mentality, the the picture of the magazine has to be the that is the standard of female or that's the standard of male. That's the standard identity of who people want to be or become, yep. and that's the standard. And if I can't achieve that, then what's the purpose of this life? If this yep. is the standard and, and media tells me this, shows me this, then it must be true. Yeah, and That's not the case. And, and I think it's exactly what is happening with the perfection, you know. Mm -hmm. Before, when, when uh, the people start to see all that magazines, we start to have that disease about food that people was getting too thin and that, uh, I don't know the name of the disease now. Anorexic. Anorexic. Yeah, anorexic, exactly. 
And now what is I think is happening exactly the same with the perfection, you know, because they see every every day is videos, perfect videos, every right. day. No one put a video failing, you know. You are putting videos and and uh, sometimes for you do one video you try fifty times, then you put the good one, you know. And what you see is like, Oof, I will never do that. Is perfect. So now I need to be perfect. And I'm listening more and more people starting to be to want to be perfect and more perfect. But the emotion of the music is gone. Sometimes even the passion is gone. Yeah, completely absolutely. gone. Now the point of playing music is to don't fail. And I think that was never the point of being a musician. You need to play music. For play notes and don't fail, we have the computer. He is the best doing it. He will never do or fail, robotic. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I I don't know if you uh, been on my page, and I the reason why I call the kind of the newsletter the uh, the recaps to all these interviews that I've been doing sound off is because I ended up uh, for some reason. The sound was off on two of my videos, not not on the interviews, but they ended up being off. And I just have to laugh at myself because, you know, things happen. We're, we're human and we all make mistakes, but it's, it's rare to see someone put that vulnerability. Like all these interviews, we talk in some instance of that vulnerability, what you're talking about now. And it's just not, it's not, I don't know, the student artist, I think they perhaps, I don't know where, I'm curious to see what our audience will leave as feedback in these moments that we will get to see as time progresses and to see how, how what we're talking about now will impact the future of our not only our instrument but music in general and the perception of passion over perfection yeah like that passion over perfection yeah wow i think of course can we fail a lot as a <laughs> professional performance and artists that they pay you for you go to the stage and uh, no we can't but can we fail? Yes. Will we fail? Probably. That's that's the point, you know? And I think the people should uh, put the energy in other things, you know? Like the way that they listen to music, they should listen to much more music. They should enjoy more our world, you know? I think that's, that's super important. We speak a lot about uh, how many times like we go to a master class, I listen that all the times when I was young, and they say, "Yeah, because we are professional athletes, so we are like, like a football player. We go to the stage and we play like exactly a football player. Go to the field and play." Yeah, but even but, they fail. We see that. Yeah, but they never told me, for example, okay, but then we need to be exactly like a football player. You know, for example. Speaking again about Ronaldo, right. he has a person that cook for him for he has the perfect diet, he has the psychologist, he is all the time watching football, you know, for example, that three things, to take care of your body, to take care of your mind, to go to the stage, and to listen to music. They are exactly the same for us, you know, we should take care of our body because it's heavy to travel, you know, for example, go to Thailand and the day after you need to be on the stage, it's heavy. You know, if your body is not in shape, it's really heavy. It is. To, to, to be on the stage one hour with your instrument like this, it's heavy, you know, you need to be in shape for that, or you should be your mindset for that. For example, that uh, example of Thailand, one day after you arrive, you don't even know where you are, you know, you are like, cannot see anything, you know, but you need to go to the stage and all the people that pay for that ticket and all the, for example, last time I was in Thailand was this year 
an amazing festival with 164 uh, players, students, wow. and they were there listening to you like, yeah, now I will listen to that amazing thing. And I, I almost couldn't say my name, you know. I was completely crazy in the jet lag. But of course, you need to have your mindset ready for that. Mm -hmm. and ready to go to the stage and of course you cannot fail a lot and 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 you you at some at the same time you need to enjoy to be there yes you know then you need to prepare yourself for that and then to listen to music why do they watch so much to football because they love football yes we also love music and we listen to music because we love that but those also forget ideas you know if you are closed in a room from your age of one month until three years old, you will not speak one word, you know? So it's exactly the same. If you don't listen to music, you don't know the way that you will go, you know? You need to listen a lot, not just to funny players, tuba, trombone, trumpet, cello, violin, singers, everything, piano. And then you will see the way that you want to go and you will you will build yourself you know and that is very important we speak so much about musician and the uh, high performance athletes are the same then we need to work exactly the same you know right. it's it's uh, in fact it's really less balance in our life because it's like all for the euphonium and a little bit <laughs> for your uh, life. we how, how many hours we are with the Ophonio in our hands? How many times we didn't go on holidays? How many times we didn't see our families? How we almost live our life for the Ophonio. Right. So we need to really love it. If it's like for the way of be famous or be rich, then we need to choose another stuff, you know, like pop singer or something, because we will never be as famous as Ronaldo or as famous as... Uh, pop singer or as, as Richard or oh, them you do that because we love it you know and uh, it's the only way of of support our career you know well, I, I love what I do and that's why I wake up every day at seven I eat my breakfast and I go to practice so I want to touch base with that on uh with you on that is that mindset of uh, richness, def those that define richness of having all the money in the world or the passion and enjoyment of what you do, which, which way is rich for the person that's watching, for the parent who is, pardon me, supporting that student artist or, or even trying to show them the way or be a reflection of where their student wants to be. Yep. Um, and for, for a lot of the artists, you know, we think of keeping up well in America, it, it, we have a term called keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the neighbor across the street or, you know, or with the kid down the hall that has all the new clothes, all the all the extra stuff. But where where is that person? Where I mean, we're we're talking about what makes each person inside, in the heart and the mind, relaxed to and accepted within themselves, not where everybody else is, to be who you want to be. Yeah. I think the answer for that is your dreams, you know, because if you have your dreams, you follow it mm -hmm. and that it's you, you know, and, uh, and you do everything for that. Sometimes the people say, yeah, but what was your plan B? I, I, I never had a plan B. Never. And it could happen. I know uh -huh. that could happen, <laughs> but I wanted to be a, a soloist. You know, and uh, and I still say to the people because some people is like now you are a soloist and and I say no, I I I I don't feel that I have everything. You know that I can like relax now. I will receive invitations every day. It's okay. No, 
I know that that doesn't exist, you know. Have three or two or three of onion players that can do it, you know. Maybe. Me, with 28 years old, I don't have anything, you know. I need to keep working, keep doing my best, keep loving euphonium, try to bring different things, trying to show myself, and is that. And if one in one time I stop to receive the invitations, I will keep, you know, I will keep practicing, I will keep trying to be the best that I can and try to keep playing euphonium. And that's my way. My point was always playing your phone at eye level. It's always what I wanted and it's what I keep want, you know, keep developing and feel home in the stage. It's for, for that that I work. Be happy on the stage, it's a feeling that I can't describe, you know. Indeed. I, I think that right here, this interview, it, I mean, I, I keep saying over and over again, it's like these interviews, these conversations that we're sharing, uh, on a global stage, uh, in hope, hope to have translated across the board is, is by far the, I, I don't see anywhere else in the world that this is happening. These conversations, this, this authenticity happening to impact even the beginner artist to know, you know, it's okay to mess up, but yeah. th that striving to be who you want to be, that dream, that dreamscape that you want to create, that you've created in your mind to be, and not accepting no, or accepting anything less than you, who you are today. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Also, an uh, uh, important thing is, for example, we are allowed to fail, always. Mm -hmm. But we are not allowed to fail and don't work on that after, you know? Like that people that think, I was so nervous that I fell a lot. I hope that the next performance, with the time, I start to be less and less nervous. That, for me, I don't allow my my students to do it because so no mindset I, you don't like that mindset at all That's i i don't like that people think hope that the next with the performance they get less nervous right i believe in the present what you will do now for you get less nervous uh, i read that yoga helps fine today you will do yoga or you are waiting for me i read that uh, that uh, do um, uh, I did that like three or four months. Meditation helps a lot. Okay, so it's today or tomorrow. It's no chance to see if in the next recital you get less nervous. That doesn't exist, you know. And uh, read books, it also help. Okay, how many do you have now for start? You know, right. I don't believe in the I will start in the gym on Monday or I will start my diet on Monday. Let's do I it believe now. now. If you fail today, okay, if he's at nine in the night, you can sleep. But if you fail at five, you have a lot of time to to start to plan how you will start to work on that tomorrow morning. Or if he's in the morning, today in the afternoon. You, you know, know? It's, it's really interesting. Uh, Betty Rom, uh, one of the composers for our instrument, uh, we did I did an interview with her, a conversation with her uh, a few days ago. And her final uh, words in our conversation was, don't think, just do. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a growing sentiment with each of these conversations and, and with artists, uh, with, with composers, conductors, you know, all these amazing uh, individuals that are here for you to help you and equip you as a current or future euphonium artist, musician, wherever your stage is in life, where you are now with that yeah. roadmap, a successful roadmap to your dream craft, not, not Moro's, not mine, not your parents, sorry, parents, not really, but your dream career, what, what you want to be in this life is who you want to be. Stop being everything else.
And I think one stuff that I also start to feel is that people want to be, for example, a f famous of funny player. I was with so many people that say, but I want to be famous. Famous. What's that Man. famous for you? Though? What that to be famous? Like, if you want to be famous in the Ophonium world, it's not so difficult nowadays. You just need to put videos every day on your Instagram, four or five hashtags, and you start. everyone knows you. But if you want to be a really of good Ophonium player, you will be known by everyone. And But for you to be a very good Ophonium player, and for you reach all your dreams one of your dreams or your big dream is to be famous it's something wrong you know it's like if you want to be a top of onion player if you love of onion if you love music perfect but to be famous in the funny world that is a really small world so you are not really famous it's just a thing that happened because you play in the festivals and because you do some recordings and you put online and the people see you, the people speak a little bit when they want to practice the piece, when they want to practice some techniques and stuff. But shouldn't be a goal, you know? And nowadays it passes a lot for that. Also because, of course, we are passing that influencers, YouTubers, stuff right. that uh, many people see and they want to kind of repeat and be famous nowadays. It's a thing that people love. But... Uh, our goal should be always about ourselves. I want to be a euphonium player because I love it. And not if you want to be famous, then you be an actor or something. It's probably a better idea than be a phonium player. Sometimes even in the, sometimes you can question like a guitar player, rock guitar player, and you say, I play a phonium, and you will say, Ah, is that percussion or you know? Right? Like, what is that? At least play an instrument that is famous, like a trumpet or a violin, something, piano. It's like, I think our dreams are the things that move ourselves. And that's, that's very important. People don't dream anymore, you know? Before, all my colleagues, when we were young, we didn't have the smartphones or internet on the phone. We dreamed a lot, you know? To be that uh, amazing football players or or uh, firefighters because we love the way that they in Portugal we have a lot of fires unfortunately so we love the way that they are kind of heroes on that stuff you know and we speak about that and uh, all you know we have free time to think when we go to social media everyone you are thinking and this and uh, reading and uh, watching other things you don't have your own life you live on that small thing you know you, you know we we talked about we spoke about in the transcripts and uh, talking about gym in the mountains uh for you to clear mm -hmm. your mind uh to get out of kind of unplugging or disconnecting from the media uh each person i think uh as as we're um nearing the end of our conversation here is I, I I almost want to say that each student artist as you're progressing wherever you're at need to find what clears your mind to where you list, start hearing yourself hearing your heart hearing your what you want to become yeah like, for example, sometimes when you cannot sleep and you like, you are crazy and you are like doing nothing, it starts to come so many ideas. Or when you are driving, I have many people that say, yeah, but when I'm driving, I have so many ideas. Why? Because you are not with your phone. You are alone. You are allowed to think, you know, you are like free. And that's what I, I think is missing. People, it's missing to be free doing a little bit of, nothing just enjoying life and think you know think a little bit in you you know go to the mountain without phones or, or you can bring a phone it's, it's, <laughs> because here sometimes with the snow it's crazy but like just speak just sometimes when you go alone just feel the nature you know and sometimes when for example i went to the mountain with yannicke we were speaking and at some point i had so many ideas 
that when I arrive down to the mountain, I had the idea for a new project with percussion, you know, because we were speaking and, you know, it's, it's like, you just need to be a normal human sometimes, you know, and to be with our thoughts is not normal. Even if for us, it's normal. For your brain, it's not normal. You know, check your phone and see that you, today you went there, you were six hours on the phone, five hours on the phone. Before that five hours, you were resting a bit or you were walking or you were speaking with people. It's different, you know, when you speak with people face to face, you know, or or if, even here, it's 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 different than when I what I post. For example, maybe you follow me. I know that on Facebook we are friends because we're there that we spoke, but on Instagram I don't know. I never I spoke so. about nothing of this, for example, on my Instagram or my Facebook, because I don't expose these things, you know, because it doesn't make sense for me to, to what I will post about this, you know, when you are speaking, but if you would be a student and speak with me, I would speak about this, you know? So speak with people and uh, follow them. It's not the same. Like, I, especially for a person like me that I, I, I'm not good at all on social media, you know? So I, on my social media, I post some videos that I hate the sound because I never liked the sound of the uh, the phone. I post the posters and it's a little bit like that, you know? Like if you want to know a little bit like what I think or what I feel that could help you on something, you need to share in person, you know? Right. And, and I think that happens, that happens with everything. If you want to listen my 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 sound, my real sound, you need to go to listen to me. You cannot listen the mandrake right, on a video and say that's the sound of him. No, it's not. And that I I I am hundred percent sure because I listen to the videos of him. Live, it's three hundred percent better. <laughs> you know, right. David Childs better. Thomas Woody, everyone in the world is better because the microphone will never be real you know even if it costs fifty thousand euros it doesn't it is not the real so we need to be real you know for for can really understand the life of the other one and who the other one is you know not on social media you want to know what kind of musician he is what kind of sound he is what kind of person he is don't go to social media have a festival there in your country? Go. You want, you love the way that uh, David Charles play? Go. Well, there you will see. You know, and it will be better. Mm -hmm. It will be better. That that I I can guarantee you. It will be better than all the recordings that you listen until now. That's phenomenal because, I mean, the whole reason for this international summit is to introduce our beginner artists, uh, you know, current and future artists introduce them to all these uh, amazing artists or uh, those that impact our euphonium world uh, on a daily basis uh, from composers, artists, and such like that um, to see who they are and if they feel that sort of spark, that, that energy, that passion that resonates within themselves to go seek out, to go see you at a local uh, masterclass or concert or a festival or wherever you're at that happens to be or even or even better yet send them an invitation if you create a festival send them an invitation to come perform at or such like that um yeah and also one thing that i start to be even more happy for example after no davy childs or after no glenn van loy or demandre they are amazing musicians, mm -hmm. but they are crazy, amazing persons, you know? And that makes so much sense for me, you know? Because for me, to be a musician and not to be an amazing musician that I like, and uh, they need to be good persons, you know? You cannot be a bad person and a good musician for me doesn't make so much sense, you know? And the way that, that they share, with me, the experience of, for example, David Childs, that has much more time 
in this business, <laughs> let's say business, right. uh, well, than me, you know, is it's amazing. And the way that uh, all the people that I like to listen is a person, it's even better and uh, motivates me even more. Phenomenal. And that you can also see, you know, can you see how I am in the social media? No. What you will, what do you say about me? Yeah, he doesn't smile so much in the photos. He must be not so nice person. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yes, like, you don't you're... know, or, or even I can be the most amazing fake person, you know, and then you meet me alive and it's like, hmm, what? Good morning. Bye. <laughs> you know, is that, it's not real. So we need to live more, you know, more normal, you know, go to festivals, enjoy, meet people. When we go to festivals, you listen to me and David, for example, and Glenn or anyway. But you will meet so many amazing friends playing also phonium, you know, you will speak about that uh, phonium thing. So many times you listen pantomime today and... Uh, how crazy is to play uh, G, I, G, and uh, how amazing is that recording and Euphonio stuff, you know? And it's so amazing to be a student in Euphonio Festival, you know? I went to all the masterclass in Portugal when I studied in that professional school, all, all of them. And just to, you, we are a small world, but we have an amazing world, you know? We do. To can speak with everyone about even mouthpieces of phoniums, our world, you know, when you have that friend that is not even a musician and you want to speak, but you don't really know, it's amazing. But when you have that friend that is with the same instrument, same passion, and you can speak about everything that they know, and then you speak about that recording they don't know and you show and it's like, wow, it's amazing. And then the other one also show other one. And that's the point of go to a festival and the masterclass It's not just to listen to that artists and to it's to leave that world you know it's it's different it's amazing and that so additional like opportunities um beyond the festivals it's being in like all region uh for those in the united states all region competitions solo competition uh and it's not the competition per se it's uh, the the other euphonium players that are there that are competing alongside with you and it's not necessarily competing against them it's seeing how you are uh in relationship to them however forging that friendship and that camaraderie the 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 essence of our world uh and to get to know well you did this better. How did you do this? How did you do that? Yeah. Uh, and that perspective can help you achieve that next level in your own plane. Yeah. That's all. Like you, you have so much to learn with everyone. You know, I remember to see my, my mother watching me playing in my bedroom. And she told, you know, you do so much. This stuff It's so strange. And I was like, that's, that's nice. Because when you do a recital, it will be people like my mother watching. It will not be euphonium players. When you play a song with orchestra, 99% are not musicians. And they will see that you are doing this and it's really strange. Why are you doing this? Then I stop <laughs> to do it. You know, you can learn with everyone, you know. Sometimes, uh, um, sometimes I speak with the students, they say, yeah, but what motivates you almost everything you know i go to give a master class and sometimes i have students with amazing sound i get really motivated with that i have students with amazing musicality that is like wow natural you know so i get motivation from everywhere i learn with everyone you know and that that is important the the important point in all of that is that we need to choose we what we want to listen and what we want to be. For example, when you go to YouTube, you can be inspired for so many stuff and there's so many amazing stuff. But it's also so many bad stuff. And distractions. You need to know 
what you want to listen, what you will be motivation motivated of, you know. Like, okay, now I will listen the solo of Seven of Mala. You have amazing performance and you have not good performance, for example. Mm -hmm. In fact, I never saw a really bad performance of I, Seven I of Mala on YouTube. But uh, it's an example. I will listen to some Mahler symphony and I click on the first. That is not good. Search for the orchestras, for example, that you know that they are good, you know, for the recordings that you like. So all that, it's like be motivated from everything, but know the filter, you know, you need to know what is good and what is bad, because if you don't know, then you, st you can start to follow what is not good. And that is also a, a nice thing to think. When you open the internet, you open all the good and all the bad. Mm -hmm. Then you need to know what to choose. What to cipher. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's that's kind of funny that how that brings it back to that particular performance uh, that you had um, with uh, Peace and uh, Cipher. That that variance. Yeah. The two yeah, yeah, and it was, in fact, it was all emotional because I couldn't play. It was uh, last year. It was in my last festival of the year. Like, my muscles were like my last festival of the summer. I had like three or four festivals in a row and my muscles were dead, oh. you know, from the beginning of the, of the festival. And in the last day was my recital, one hour. Oi. Yeah, and I was like, I don't even know how I can play, you know? I was putting a cream that um, uh, a tuba player that is also as a pharmacy, she she gave me a stuff that would help to relax and all. It was a crazy festival. And then play one hour. I, I had a blind spot, peace, Michelangelo, Cypher, uh, Saxornia, Pearls, and I finished in a duet with uh, Sergio. With Orbis. Uh because Sergio is from that region and he went there for play that with, with me in the end of the performance, like Encore. Uh, and everything was so crazy. Like, the, for example, the theater was made for cinema and theater. So it was like dry, but like another level of dry, you know? In fact, I have a video of, of, uh, of the, uh, that theater in my Instagram. Uh, some uh, some video that the guys of the lights are going around and my pen is almost uh, killed them in the in the <laughs> dress reel. So it was fun. Uh, so I was so, you know, I knew that I was not one hundred percent to give one hour of mass of uh, recital with piano. But at some point when I started to play, it was like, I don't know, you know, I was so relaxed. It, inside of that yeah and i was really relaxed and i was inside of the music and when i play peace i was like wow it's it's crazy it's the and in the it. end the a trumpet player that uh, she is she and the, the boyfriend are like the they are organizing that festival she she told do you look at me in the end of the piece? And I told, I look and you were crying like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, she was crying, you know? And it was like, okay, it's not just me then that right. are feeling that thing. It was a, you cannot, you cannot describe, you know? I have some performance that are a little bit more. You transcend. Okay, I have this, I go, I play, perfect, let's go. I have other performance that have something that you cannot really explain. And that one was one of them. UFO in Holland was another one of that. Like, we are humans. We humans. We just humans. We just feel things, and sometimes we feel the things, and we cannot explain. It's it's the it's the point, you know. And yeah, after that, play cipher. It's like first for play cipher, you need to be crazy anyway, because <laughs> all that jumps and all that stuff. But uh, it was really heavy because I was not in the mood of uh, playing uh, hip hop, you know, that is a hip hop almost. But uh, then it was fun also, and it helps to recover from the sadness. <laughs> of the piece. Wow, that is amazing. So, hmm, 
I definitely want you back on uh, for uh, with the next uh, with what's coming for uh, future Euphonium summits uh, coming on and what would be your top A2 books for beginners that you would recommend them starting out with our beginner artist? We have a lot of, of books, but in fact, that uh, books that use all the range of the euphonium, in fact, we don't have that much. You know, then we need to be like a trumpet and we kind of uh, put some positions in the end of the exercise or go a little bit more low, a little bit more up. Most of the books, even the books for trombone that has almost the same range than euphonium, they never go to the extremes, you know. Mm-hmm. We are like, we create limits, you know. So nature don't have limits. When we appear in this amazing planet, we create limits. Like sea don't have limits, you know. If you don't stop the sea, it will destroy everything. In the winter, it goes out, everything. If you don't cut the trees in a forest, it will destroy your city, you know. It's like, and we put a lot of limits in, in the books. And I kind of understand because you don't know if the person that will use that can go until that limits. But also when you have students that use a lot of books, they start to play in that limit. Like, okay, now I will go until a C. A D is already really high. Or maximum you see in a book a F. You know? And then in the low you go until a C, until a G pedal maximum, you know? Right. So what what I feel about books is like use them, but know the way how to practice. You know, know where you want to to what you want to practice and, and uh, what you want to do, and use that as like, a, yeah, you see the exercise. Okay, it's that exercise that I will do, but then complete the exercise for do a complete practicing. But uh, yeah, I remember to use a lot uh, by Lean, the flexibilities book. I love mm-hmm. that. Clark, it's a really nice book. Arba, it's a very nice book. Vizuti also has a very nice uh, book, Vizuti Volume 1. I think I used a lot of that uh, four books. Not so, in fact, the one that I used less of that four was Clark. I never liked to practice technique. To, nowadays, I still don't like, you know? Yeah, I hate to practice fast uh, stuff. Even what? if I need to play. Yeah. I don't like it. What's mm. your... <laughs> That's so uh, counter of what is posted and stuff like that and what's really premiered online. I, I mean, it, it, overall for Euphonium players, you know, it, we, we tend to see the younger uh, generation, the younger student artists always go fast, 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 fast. Technique, 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 and everything has to be perfect. Uh, as we spoke about throughout this uh, interview, this conversation, and sometimes it's all about slowing down and enjoying the piece, learning yeah. how it's supposed to sound when you play it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, some, for example, I even saw a post that say if you are learning a new piece search for videos of that piece i don't I think that, that is correct yeah you know it's like when you are practicing a new piece learn the piece see how you want to sound on that piece after listen the piece like you can listen some recordings for see how it sounds with piano and all but if you practice the piece yourself practice the piano part like see the piano part see what will happen then create your your way of playing that piece, and then you can listen. You oh, know? that goes back to what we were just talking about with limits. Hmm. We set our own limits when we when we go to listen to those recordings. Yeah, those limits get set. Yeah, exactly. With our ears, and and also you you get to play that in their version. You know, because if if you are learning a piece 
and you are listening to that every day, someone practicing, you will play that in that way. You will not play in your way, you know? And when you receive a new piece for you do the premiere, you don't know how to play the piece because you don't have any recording. So that's interesting. How would you approach, well, with that being said, Maro, would be, what would you, how do you approach sight reading? Yeah, I, I for example, now I'm, I'm learning a new piece that I will play solo in Spain as an encore. It's called Two Folk Tunes from Valdres. It's a piece that was uh, read from, uh, that was wrote for Thormodflaten. And it's like two folk tunes from here. Valdres, it's a place in, in Norway. And first of all, what I do is to play the piece from the beginning until the end, you know, forever an idea. Ah, but you can play all that things. No. I just kind of fake a bit and keep, you know, and try to have a, a, like a image and idea of what I want for that piece. Then I start to work in the places. Then I try to practice the piece from the beginning until the end again and try to set what I want to do with the piece. First time I was listening to, to that piece was today, in fact, from the recording of Tormod. Right, I, I've listened to it. Yeah, some it's a really nice piece. It's gorgeous. And uh, and now I will do things different from Tormod. I will do I play that on my way, you know. But I listen now. I see also a little bit how it sounds with. Uh, I think he's playing with brass band. I will play with a wind band. It's also nice sometimes to to listen because we don't have. For example, I will have one realser for that performance. So then you you know a little bit more the the orchestra part or brass band or wind band anyway. But then that way you will create yourself. You know that way you'll create the way that you play the pieces. And not the way that, like, I would copy Tormod, you know? How does that interpretation, uh, when you go to perform with that wind ensemble that's playing as your accompaniment, how, how do you let the conductor know, hey, I'm not, I'm not Tormod. I, I am me, I am, I have a certain way of I, uh, me playing it. Yeah, and that I, I I try to put even in like the first email, you know. I send like every hey, web uh, recording. I will probably not play like this. You can listen to it. You can like uh, kind of show yeah. them if they want to feel. But in the in fact, in that music, for example, I like I will play almost everything like Tormod will play because it's. It's the way that the piece is, you it know, it's that. a folk tune. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit, I will play, of course, a little bit uh, different in some parts, but it will be more or less that. But when I arrive, I try to put already the points or what I want to do from the beginning, you know, and then in the end of the, the or I hope sometimes that in the end of the real it will work. But uh, of course, I need to understand that we have one realser. They also just have one realser with me. So it's a kind of balance. Right. For example, sometimes when I play blind spot, they say, yeah, but it's impossible to play that uh, fast in the end or that fast in that part or that part like that. And we can, we need to balance, you know. It's not a pro professional orchestra that pay you for you be there four or five days or for a four rehearsals before a performance, you know, that you have time to work with them. Right. Sometimes you just have one rehearsal. When I have time, I try to do as much as I can. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's a balance. Also, sometimes the conductor uh, have uh, really good ideas and I, I like to listen. What was your best idea that you've heard uh, from a conductor in regards to one of uh, your premieres or one of your performances? Joke or uh, sure? Let, let's hear. Let's hear one of the uh, what happened. No joke was one that it was not so long time ago that the conductor told. So I I told you need to do the beginning. You need to put like to count the four tempos for we for they really understand the tempo before we start because it's really fast. 
and uh, they told she told from the first time i will not do it and uh, i told okay but probably we will fail then no 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 and it was almost uh, down in the first two bars in the concert so she, it was like i told that she should do that because i already did it with many other conductors and uh, it's the only way we right. tried and she told no and in the end yeah it, it almost went down in the first wow. two bars because they didn't understood the tempo and um, yeah best i have many for example i i when i play ufo with uh, Henry adams i had john d may there so he could uh, he, he was the guy that composed it so he, he gave me a lot of stuff also i think the premiere of that concerto was david childs with Henry Adams in Holland, I think. Wow. So the, he knew a little bit more uh, about that piece and he brings some ideas that help. Normally, it's not the way that you play. It's the way that it can help for we be together with the orchestra, like easy, mm -hmm. uh, easiest way to 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 be together with the, with the orchestra, with the band or whatever. And be willing so, to... I, I I always like to listen to the others, you know. I don't like when you arrive and uh, and uh, you feel that stuff of okay, he's a young player, so my ideas are my ideas, you know. When the conductor look at you like that, it never almost it almost never happened. But for example, that time about uh, four tempos happened and uh, it destroyed completely the performance in the first two bars, for example. Well, I mean, it's the expectation and. And maybe something wasn't communicated effectively enough, I guess. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe you look at 28 years old and you are 55 or something and you are like, what does he know about this? <laughs> True. And that's, sometimes. that's unfortunate sometimes. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Normally, in fact, it's what I like to do most, you know, play solo with orchestras. That's recitals amazing. with piano are amazing but like one hour of recital with piano you know that you need to be so concentrated one hour but and your, it's your chops are yeah and it's like one hour that with piano you you almost don't rest it's no, all the time going yeah. on you know and all the small details they will listen everything with orchestra sometimes you can hide a bit in the orchestra you you will you, you will normally play one two pieces maximum three pieces and yeah. that is not normal in the recital you need to play eight right you know so it's yeah it's also a little bit easier for the body you know to mm -hmm. to play three two pieces than one hour of recital and the practicing it's more effective because we have more time to practice that two pieces or three pieces than the eight pieces yeah what an exceptional uh, conversation. It, it really does. Uh, every single one of these uh, with artists like yourself and and I hope the intention that these beginner students that are watching uh, from now till whenever uh, get to see, um, hear, feel what it really means to us being artists, composers, um, this identity and taking the mantle, uh, taking it on as this is what you want to do, being a euphonium performer, yeah. a euphonium artist. And, but don't, don't, don't copy or, or don't copy us per se, but utilize the roadmaps that we're giving you uh, in yeah. these interviews, these conversations and make it your own. Yeah, exactly. Go to your mountaintop. <laughs> and yeah, but that's that's amazing. That's the feeling, you know, to go to a top of the mountain. It's amazing. Right. See, see that view, uh, whatever view that is. And there in Norway, the views are like speechless. Yes, yeah, speechless or undescribable. There's mm. so many. Like you, you just don't. I'm, I'm getting shivers because if you haven't. If you're a beginner artist, if you haven't gone to the top of a mountain, it's a it's it's a climb usually to get to a top of a mountain, not a hill, a mountain. Go to your 
go to a state park if you're in the United States or internationally. If you find a mountain that's not a volcano, active volcano. <laughs> uh, important point. Right. Very important point. <laughs> right. Um, look at that summit. Go to the top and view that. That's your limit. That oh. I, really that 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 encapsulates our whole conversation. Go yeah. to the top of the mountain. That's your limit. See see what's the possibility. Of your life. And also, if you go to a, a top of a mountain, you can see that the nature of the world has no limits. Because if you can see the mountain finish where us finish, you know, like the trees finished when we cut that. If not, they would be all around. You no, know, it has no limit for a forest has no limit for nature we create the limits and i think that's the best create, uh, limits yeah. nature doesn't have limits so we should and create the limits why are we practicing so high why are we practicing so low because we want because we can why should i just play until i see because then it's too high and if it's too high, why you just don't go? Is not good. Isn't it good to go to high? Isn't it good to do crazy things? It's good. It's amazing. It, 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 if done healthy and with the right motivation. Yeah, of course. Because if you go crazy, you're going to end up hurting yourself or someone else. If you need to know how to go, you know, it's like you cannot wake up today and say, okay. I never run more than three kilometers, but today I will run the marathon. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but like if you're, if if you want to run the marathon and you say, okay, I want to run a marathon in six months from today, yeah. I will run every day for prepare to run that marathon. I say six months, but of course can be even more in fact. Yeah. Right now, where I'm at, it'd probably take me about ten months to train for a marathon. Yeah, yeah, it, maybe, it, it, maybe it, longer. Yeah. It also de depends in the shape that you are now, mm -hmm. but uh, you know what I mean. It's like, and also important stuff is, don't enjoy, don't think. Yeah, and when I arrive there, I will be the most like the happiest guy in the world. Because when you arrive there, first you need to have at least ten other goals already. And then you need to enjoy all the steps. You know that day that you arrived to a C and then you went to a C sharp and the sound was good? Man, be happy. You know, it's a C sharp that sounds amazing. And before you couldn't play that amazing. When you arrive to a D, but if your goal is a C, practice it until you arrive there. But you need to enjoy all the steps. Enjoy the and journey. That's very important. Yeah, but everyone arrived to have why should i enjoy a d because you didn't arrive there before and you are developing you know it's like it's your way it's most of the people it's it's more than normal that uh, with the age of them they don't go as high as me or as low as me or as high as david because they don't have all that years mm -hmm. or sometimes they didn't work you know on on the the correct way but if today you are 30 years old. You start to practice correct. Your goal is a C. You listen to me playing that C. And I'm youngest than you. You still need to enjoy yourself because you are not me. I'm sure that you can do a lot of other things better than me. If, like with Euphonium, you know? Like. But that's my journey. Whatever. Your yeah. journey is yours. Mine's mine. Exactly. And, you know, we have different journeys. We have different plans for our life. We just need to have the dream and the plans, you know, because when I arrive to a student, I say, do you have dreams? Ah, yeah. Do you have a plan what you want to be? Yeah, more or less. That for me, it's like, what are you doing to our life? You need to dream. Mm -hmm. Jesus, when I was young, I dreamed so much. And now I keep dreaming so much that sometimes. I don't say my dreams, in fact, to no one. But with Yannick, I say sometimes. And uh, 
or most of the times. And sometimes he's like, that's a really big one. And I told him, yeah, and it will be even bigger after I reach that one because I will have even bigger ones after, and that is crazy. Right. <laughs> you know, but he's like, he's the fool. That Why am I waking up and go to practice at seven if I don't have a goal? You know, if I don't have dreams, if my dreams would be, okay, playing recitals or keep to play these pieces, I need to have goals. I need to have dreams. I need to keep going up. You know, it's the, it's the point of like people, you know, mm -hmm. you need to have to keep going. You need to keep developing in some way, you know? Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Hmm, that's fascinating. I look forward to our next conversation, uh, especially uh, uh, to further some of these thoughts. And and um, I think I think this is going to impact a lot of people um, where they're at now. Uh, I mean, if they're watching this now, they obviously there's a reason and purpose for them reaching to this point in this this conversation that they've found a kind of the same essence and feeling of where they're at and where they're where we're we're talking about right now because those that don't reach this point in the video may not be ready to hear what we have to say yeah and that's okay. and in fact that happened all the time you know if you put a video in fact, I didn't knew how to say like um, the, I don't know, it's like the media of the people, yeah, the, like um, we, how many seconds are the media of the people? Right. And, and sometimes it's like 25 Six, seconds. Yeah, 9 to 25 seconds. Yeah. And you put a video of 9 minutes. Then just after I, I saw it, I started to put uh, videos of maximum one minute. Right. And that's why, you know, that's why we're doing this in a lengthy conversation to where I can create smaller segments of our conversation, bite-sized elements for people to uh, get to understand some elements. And yeah, if they but I think in podcasts and, uh, for example, I listen a lot of uh, podcasts and I think on podcasts is... The people listen a lot of, uh, in fact, hours. Yes, I think yeah. so too. What's your favorite podcast, by the way? I listen to many and really different. I have one, and I'm not good on on names, so That's okay. I, I have them on my. Uh, <laughs> Tell me a screenshot, what? would you? I have some speaking about uh, music. Mm -hmm. I have a really good podcast that I completely forget the name that they speak about performance. They speak yesterday. I was listening one of the the episodes where they, they were speaking about uh, social media, how to develop the social media that in fact, I didn't really like because they speak that you should play like pop music and uh, like yeah. movies and stuff for rich more followers. And, and I, in fact, don't really want to work for rich more followers. I, like the things that I post most of the time it's from my performance you know for example today I received my performance in Thailand solo with brass band and maybe I will put some clips of that and is that if I don't receive them I, I will not put anything you know <laughs> uh, and uh, I also like to see one about uh, bodybuilding because I, I do gym so I like to learn the techniques also sometimes the the good techniques of diet and stuff uh i yeah it's most of that you know like one that also speaks a lot about mindset about a little bit of auto control most most this oh huh, that's cool I, I i'm curious to see what that playlist looks like uh as in all your podcasts uh usually they're like one after like uh yeah it, it is like the episodes right all right all right uh, I'm, I'm curious if you would send me a screenshot of that. Yeah, I can send you the screenshot of the, the podcast. That, after. That'd be really awesome. So with that being said, create our own limits. We create our limits. I love we that. create our limits and we shouldn't. 
never we don't have any limits you know the instruments can have some limits and we can pass them love it love it yeah thank you so much for joining us on this uh the inaugural uh euphonium international euphonium summit uh held virtually this year and uh hope to uh put these in person with a hybrid virtual component uh, for years. Yeah, ago. maybe when I'm in Texas, we can do a podcast live. I, absolutely. But I have something to share with you right after this. So Okay, uh, okay. I'm looking for, for, for <laughs> Exactly. Uh, you're, you're tipping my head here a little bit. Um, I, I'm really excited. I can't wait to grab a coffee with you um, when you do come or when I uh, visit up there or wherever we happen to find ourselves uh, yeah. each time. Thank you all so much for joining us, joining Morrow Martins, myself, Nicholas, and this International Euphonium Summit. Leave a comment below of what, uh, what impact uh, you felt or have gleaned from or experienced, if any, uh, below. Uh, message Morrow if you're interested in having him for your festival or a master class or, or performance or something, if you have an idea. Uh, reach out to us, reach out to him. I'll leave all the links below. Thank you so much for this amazing time. Incredible. Yeah, thank you very, very much for uh, the invitation. It was really a pleasure to be here sharing a little bit of me with you and also with the people that uh, will uh, listen to, to us. I'm looking forward to read all the comments and to see what people will write about it. And uh, right. thank you very much for all the ones that are uh, watching us. Absolutely. Thank you. And if it, you know, if we can impact one person to become uh, their, their ideal dream state, their, their, their best, exactly the very best of themselves, not one of us, not one of the artists or composers be their best each yeah. day. It's a win. That's the goal. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. Have a good one.